buenas tardes. Um, buenas tardes. How has the conference been for you so far? Yes? I'm so glad to hear that. I know I have enjoyed it hearing from the different speakers. I've, I've learned so much. But this is the end, end session, the last day. So I think it's time we have a little fun. Now, you all have been sitting for a really long time. Now, we're game developers, so I know we're used to sitting for a very long time. But still, except for the people who just climbed the five flights of stairs, you're good. The rest of us, let's just stand up. Yeah, let's just stand up, you know, do whatever you gotta do, kind of. <laughs> Okay, I don't have any music, I don't have to. Okay, just get the blood flowing. I am gonna be so much funnier if you just move first. Oh, see, Oscar's got it down, Oscar. Woo, woo, okay, all righty. Very nice, okay, now sit down, exercise over. No, I'm kidding. You can still stay standing, I don't care. We're in a bar, you know, hey, have fun with it. All righty, um, so. Uh, my name is Barbara Chamberlain, and thank you all very much for sticking through this to the last session on the last day. But I'll tell you, this is the session I like the most. Because at the end of a conference, your brain is full, and you have a lot of information, and you want to go use it, and you feel excited and overwhelmed at the same time. If it's a good conference, right now you should be about like this. And if you feel like that, it's a good conference. So I'm so glad that you all have came. And I have to come, and I have to tell you, I'm just so honored to have been able to have come and speak to you. And I've been so, so impressed. Not only with the people that we have met, Colombianos, you are so friendly and generous and well, warm and welcoming. And I know all the speakers have felt this. Thank you for that. And also, I'm just so impressed with the level of game development going on here. I really am so pleased. So thank you for letting me have a very small part of that. All right. Um, so let's Let's, let's get this party started. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today, this is a very, this is kind of like my cardio. You know, stand up, sit down, that's all the exercise I get. Four flights of stairs and a couch, that's my workout today. Okay. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about us at our very best. Now, the first thing I want to do, um, oh, I should give you a little background. We're the Learning Games Lab. Those of you who have been here, you know this repeat slide. We develop educational media, variety of audiences, kids, adults, what have you. We're a very small studio. We are not, we are not like these other studios that have, and so I learn so much from them. We're a very small group, and everything we do is for education. Not all for kids, but everything for education. Um, now, I want to tell you um, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is that 20 years ago, eh, I'm also going to cinco años, um, I met this person, uh, Dr. Jeannie Gleason. So if I might introduce her, please. So <laughs> I have been so fortunate in that not only did I learn 20 years ago what I wanted to do and what I enjoyed and what was fun, but I found a mentor, somebody who was generous and gracious and cared most about the people who worked for her and how to help them find projects that they liked. And Jeannie runs our department. We do video, we do animation, we do media, we do print, we do comic books, and Jeannie runs all of that. So if you have questions too and want to talk to her, she probably, well, not probably, she knows a lot more about this as well. And when I was invited to come to Columbia, I told her, and she said, oh, and I said, well, come on, let's go. <laughs> so she came with me. Now, Jeannie also has, if you'd like, we have some little bookmarks, little cards with some of our games on them. You are welcome to those. I think we'll pass those out where you'd like them. We get paid for games up front through grants. So for us, finding eyeballs, people to just play the game is the hardest part. So we'd love your eyeballs. Okay, so back to this. Um, I uh, did stand-up comedy many, 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 many years ago um, before I got into this field. And I wanted to become a speaker, the kind of person who would go to conferences and entertain. And, and there's, it's a whole other talk why I'm not a comic anymore. But I was told by someone at that point, he said, I said, how do you get to be a speaker? How do you go and do that and get paid to go give speeches at conferences? And he said, it's not about the jokes. And it's not about the cute stories. You have to go and find something so amazing you can't help but to talk about it. And so let me tell you what I found that was amazing. Angry birds. Now, I know you know what angry birds are, except for those of you who have been living in a cave <laughs> for the past five years and have not seen the angry birds hats that you can buy anywhere here in Bogota. Um, this is what is interesting to me about angry birds. One billion downloads. 
Now, Angry Birds, certainly, it has changed game design, level design. There's a lot of wonderful things as a game designer about Angry Birds. But as a player, here's what excites me. A billion people, and this, this, this is old, this is old data, worldwide have played Angry Birds. This is not a game for game players. This is a game for people who would never admit to being a gamer, right? If you say, do you play games? They'd be like, no, I don't waste time with that. I'm an important business professional. I don't play games, but they've played Angry Birds. And so what's happened is we now have this whole group of people who are learning about the power of games. A whole new group of people who understand and remember why they're fun. That you can play games in short bursts wherever you are while you're waiting for your child after school or when you're in a meeting or in the bathroom. Not you. Other people play games in the bathroom, I'm sure. <laughs> not you here. Not us. Other people. So they, they are learning what we all know about games, which is how wonderful it is to be able to play in bursts, or to play with other people, or to, to learn from each other, or to see your progress over time, or to realize that you couldn't do level 16, but now you did level 1 and level 2 and level 3, and then now you can do level 16, and you think, I can do that. This is introducing a whole world of people to the power of gameplay, not just for entertainment, not just for engagement, not just for social, not just for nation, for all of that. And that is why I'm so excited about Angry Birds. Let me tell you something else that excited me. Plants vs. Zombies. Yeah? How many Plants vs. Zombies players did we have here? Okay. I, uh, I love this game, I gotta tell you. As a game designer, we did a tower defense game to learn uh, coordinate points on a graph for math. It's, it's awesome, it's called Game Over Gopher. And it, this just inspired us in their level selection. Their tutorial is beautiful. Their use of achievements is really very nice. The way they change gameplay throughout, you do it on the lawn, you do it with water, you do it at dark, you do it at night, there's many games within. This was a beautiful, polished, lovely game. And I have my mother-in-law playing this game. And my son, who was learning to read, but he still didn't really buy that reading was valuable. He kind of just thought it was busy work, you know, that once kindergarten and first grade was over, he wouldn't have to read anymore. <laughs> and he could play Plants vs. Zombies, but not well. Because to play Plants vs. Zombies, it helps to be able to read what the plants and the zombies could do, and we wouldn't read it for him. And a light bulb switched where suddenly he thought, reading, it's useful, I. <laughs> and Plants vs. Zombies did that for him. And just, just to tell you, these are my achievements in Plants vs. Zombies. Thank you. All but three. And just as an aside, if any of you can tell me how to get that better off dead, I would be really very grateful because I can't, I can't do it. So I have spent a considerable amount of time playing this game. And then this happened. And, and then this happened. And then this happened and then I deleted it from my iPad. Now, we have had many sessions here, very good sessions on monetization, and I understand that, and it's important, and I want you to be able to make money on your apps, and you have learned from some of the best here over the past two days. And this is, this is not a bad model, okay? Daily, average recommended daily, uh, 231 million, okay? And, and that's, that's nothing, that's nothing. Daily. Yeah? Okay. That's pretty impressive, right? But I want to talk to you about what inspires me and what makes me excited to be a game developer and what I love and how we're going to change the world. And that isn't it. That isn't it. And I don't think, and I think it was Jamie asked, who here is in it to just make the money? If you really want to make money, I hate to break it to you, there are easier ways. <laughs> than to be a game developer. There, maybe you should rethink and go into banking because you are never going to make it. I don't know, you could. You could make your millions. But we don't, we don't get into game development to make money. We get into development for other reasons. There's something else that drives us. Money is the thing that we have to do so that we can do the thing we want to do. And I understand that. So we're at the end of the session. Let's, let's talk about why we do what we do. What is our big challenge? 
Okay. One of the most common challenges when I think about big challenges, one of the great grand challenges was when we put a man on the moon. Now, I'm a space nut. I am a space nut. We live in Las Cruces, Nuevo Mexico, and we have the spaceport, the first commercial spaceport about 40 miles down the road. So come see us and we'll put you into outer space in, you know, 20 years if you have $300,000. <laughs> and now when this happened, President Kennedy announced we're going to put a man on the moon. He, he, he just announced it. You know, he didn't have a panel. He didn't ask people. He didn't work it up in an agile scrum session. He just said, we're going to put a man on the moon. And everybody at NASA said, what? What, what did he? <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna, we had 15 minutes total time of a man in outer space when he said that, 15 minutes. We didn't even know what we didn't know. We didn't know how to feed them up there, how long a person could stay in space. We didn't know how to get them up there. There were three different ways we could launch around the moon. We didn't know how to do that. We didn't know, was it a different shuttle that took them to the moon? From the, we didn't know how to do that. A lot of geologists thought the reduced gravity was such that we would try to land and would just keep sinking, that we couldn't even land. And the country, and NASA, the administrator of NASA, the Space Administration, said, who wants my job? <laughs> who wants my job? And it's, it's probably fair to say they freaked out a little bit. And Kennedy addressed that. He said, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that challenge is one we are willing to accept. So what are our challenges in game design? What are our grand challenges? Because I'll tell you something, games can change things. Games can change behavior. This study, it was done a few years ago, Gerard, Tucat, Bouchard, and Gerard, they did a crushing cigarettes game, virtual, VR. So Pablo, a VR game for you. Okay. So um, they took uh, 91 participants, put them through a 12-week successful smoking cessation program. They wanted to stop smoking. They put them through the program, and they divided them into two groups. It was identical for both groups. Okay? Group, they both went in for a total of four weeks, half an hour every week, total gameplay of two hours. That's it. Solamente dos horas. And I like to say the Spanish words I know, so you've got like eight more coming. Um, and they put them into two groups, and they each played this game, the same game, with a virtual helmet. They went around to town, finding things and crushing them with their hands, okay? Here's the difference in the two groups. One group went around the town and found little green balls. One group went around the town finding cigarettes. That was the only difference. The group that crushed cigarettes, more of them quit smoking, more of them stayed in the program for the duration. They felt more confident about the ability to not start smoking again. And the only difference was that. Games can change behavior. We were inspired by that when we did Ninja Kitchen. This is to teach kids how to, how to cook food safely. So um, the problem with cooking food safely is you don't know that you don't know it. And you don't really want to learn it. And a lot of times when you've made a mistake, you don't know that that was what made you sick. So how do you teach somebody something that they don't know that they don't know that they don't want to learn? Again, my apologies to the translators. So um, <laughs> Ninja Kitchen, um, we just, it's, it's a diner dash game. That's all it is. Where you go through and first you have to wash your hands. Hold on, we're going to take you for a run. Okay, so you're going to wash your hands and then you start serving people. You get the juice. Okay, and as you play, it gets harder. And then you have sandwiches, and then you fill the juice orders, and then you have to get the produce. And you have to get the produce because it's dirty, and you can see the contamination. You get the produce out of the refrigerator. You take it to the guy who's going to wash it. Then you take it to the guy who's going to cut it. Then you deliver it. Then you get meat, and then you learn you have to cook meat to a proper temperature, and you have to change the plate between the meat. So that by the time you're at the end, you've got the plate. You wash the plate. You take the plate. You go to the refrigerator. You get the meat. You take the meat to the stove. You wash or get the meat cooked. Then you take your plate. You wash the thing. You get a clean plate, you go back to the stove, you pick it up, you get the veggies, you take the veggies, get them washed, you get them washed, you get the clean plate, you go back, you get the meat, you get the veggies that are cut, you put them on the plate, you deliver it to the customer. That's what I was apologizing for earlier. <laughs> but you have to keep in mind, this doesn't all happen in the first level. 
It happens level by level by level. So by the time you unlock levels 14 to 15, where you can't see any contamination, you just know what to do. So is this what your passion is? Do you want to change behavior? I know some of you do. I've talked to some of you. Do you want to change behavior? It's OK. OK. So games can change things. Absolutely. Games can illuminate concepts. I mentioned earlier I do some math games, so I was very excited to find the math game Exponential Zombies, because that's an awesome title, OK? So this is Exponential Zombies. The way you play Exponential Zombies, this is not our game, is you um, match the number to the exponent. And if you get it right, you get to fire a cannon. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't that look like fun? Yeah. You know who's good at this game? People who already know exponents. You know who sucks at this game? The people who need to learn exponents. You can't test them on it and then get them, but oh, you're going to fire a cannon. That's so much fun. Jean Piaget is a learning th was a learning theorist, one of my favorites. He's a constructivist. And he said, are we forming children who are only capable of learning what is already known? And when I have a game that quizzes you on what you know, the most you can learn is what I've taught you to answer. That's it. That's the most we can do. And so you have to ask yourself, how do we find out what people know? What is that? Well, that's testing. How do we facilitate learning? That's teaching. And they both have a place. There is a both place in time. But testing is not teaching. They are two separate things. So be careful when you're using your games. Let me tell you what excites me about learning, not memorizing facts. This is what excites me about learning. Minecraft. Minecraft, sandbox game where you just build. My son, the nine-year-old who didn't want to read until Plants vs. Zombies, um, has some attention problems. He doesn't really pay attention to anything for longer than 10 minutes at a time. And I sat and watched him for two hours. He built a roller coaster around his animal zoo in Minecraft. And he had a hill, and he went down the hill. And he was trying to get the car to go up the hill and down the hill and over. And up the hill and down the hill and over. And he'd build it up. Go up the hill and down the hill. And he'd build this up. Up the hill and down the Woo! <laughs> build that down a little bit. For two hours, he was engaged. And you know why? Because nobody was telling him what to do. He got to ask his own questions. He got to answer his own questions. He got to experiment until he learned it for himself. This is what games do at their best, is they illuminate concepts to help you understand things that you didn't know before. Games can change things. Games can encourage exploration. OK? I'm a constructivist, so I also like Maria Montessori, another learning visionary. She said that education is a natural process and is acquired not by listening to words, but from experiences in the environment. Now, I realize how strange it is to tell you this in a lecture. But that's what games do. Isn't that it? I can tell you this. All I, all, I, all I want, I can talk to you. I can lecture to you. But when you experience it in the environment, that's when learning happens. And games provide that. Have you ever gone out to look at the stars at night? And you've looked at something. Is that a star? Is it a planet? Is it a spaceship? I don't know. What is, what is that bright star right there? OK. Well, a plane, yes, is a satellite. OK, well, let's switch this over to I need, would someone be willing to come and hold my mic for me? Pablo, come have a seat, Pablo. OK, good. I know you have many skills beyond simply holding a mic. <laughs> I know, the, the compliments just never cease, huh? <laughs> OK, so um, let's look at Starwalk. I've switched to my iPad. Has anyone used the app Starwalk before? Yeah? Oh, it's pretty cool, huh? OK, it's a star map. OK, so you have to kind of use your imagination. So you are seeing what I'm seeing, OK? So you go out at night, and you see a bright star, and you hold this up. And you say, oh, that's the sun. OK, Greta and I could have gotten that one. Oh, there's Mars, that's Jupiter. And you can see directly, you can see the constellations. Have you ever tried to do constellations and you have that card and it's like a guy with three stars on his belt and there's a billion stars and you can't figure out? This tells you right there. Okay, but there's this interesting thing in Starwalk. Okay, do you see that dotted line? Can you see that as I follow it around? Okay, the dotted line right there, can you see that? Am I making anybody seasick yet? Okay, there's this dotted line and I didn't know what the dotted line was. 
like, what is a dotted line? I noticed all the planets were on the dotted line. And I thought, are we in some kind of planet in alignment thing? You know, why are all the planets? Because I remember taking science in school, and I remember there's like the sun. I know the sun is the center of the universe, and then planets, right? Isn't that, that how it works? Model is not to scale, but sun and planets. OK, so why are they all lined up? So I started Googling like planets in alignment, which brought up wacky stuff that made no sense. And I always wondered what was this dotted line. So about that time, I found this other app called Solar System. Touch press, touch press, beautiful apps. Oh, touch press makes beautiful apps. So solar system is kind of, we call it in the US a coffee table book. You know, just something you can just get in and look at and experience. So you can, let's see, we'll go, we'll look at um, the earth there. Okay, there's a, woo, we can spin it around and have some fun. Woo, okay, you can learn about it, that's great. Okay, so um, let's go back. But here's what's really interesting about this app. Let me click on the sun. Okay, this is an orrery, so you can see the planet's going around the sun. And you can speed it up and be like, whoo, and you can slow it right down again. Whoo, okay, so now I can zoom in here, and now I can really see, if I slow it down, see how easy it is to explain to someone how night and day works? And then if you wanna really kinda have fun with it, you can speed it up and you can see how seasons work because the axis isn't perfectly perpendicular to the sun. Okay, but that's not the cool thing. Now I want you to notice something. Let me zoom out a little bit. What happens here? Yes, yes. They're all in there. It's like a dinner plate, not the scientific term, I realize. But it's not sun planets, it's sun planets. They're all on one plane. Yeah, that was the dotted line. Now I get that. And not only that, look at this. What's, what's, what's that? What is, what's that? It's hard to see, I know. You see how one of those things is not like the other? Pluto. Yes! Pluto! Remember when he got kicked out of the Planets Club? <laughs> yeah, Clyde Tombaugh, the man who discovered Pluto at New Mexico State University, we had protests. It was quite a week. Don't discriminate against Pluto. But if I had this, duh, it is too not a planet. Look at that. It's so obvious. The kind of learning you get to do in an environment, that's the best kind. It's the best kind. No, let's see. Oh, there's more, oh, there's more. Okay, so games can change things, absolutely. Games can customize learning. I was talking at a conference about uh, youth at risk and looking at what kind of apps are best for youth at risk, and I went to my friend, uh, Jennifer Wells, and she said this. And she said this. The best technology engages the user in something he doesn't normally have access to. Isn't that a lovely idea? It's not one app for all at-risk people. It's what do you need? What does each individual user need? And the beauty of the iPad and mobile computing is you can deliver it to them when they need it, when they have it. So I'm gonna show you something. This is my favorite. Okay, Smule Magic Piano. Okay, anybody played Smule Magic Piano? Yeah? Okay, so they know. Y'all can go to the bathroom if you want, that's fine. Okay, so Smule Magic Piano. Um, this is gonna be tricky because you need to simultaneously get me and the sound coming out of this. So let's see. Okay, so let's start with, um, okay, all these songs, whatever. Okay, Gloria Gaynor, do you know who Gloria Gaynor is? Okay, I'm gonna mess with the translators a little bit more, con permiso. Okay. <laughs> oh no, wireless. Oh, oh no, 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 okay, has to be in. Okay, so here we go. One note, one finger. Two notes, two fingers. See? Three notes, three fingers. <laughs> yeah. I could never live without you by my side. I've been thinking of so many nights, thinking how you did wrong. I grew strong. Are they doing it? Are you doing it? You singing? <laughs> Checking. They're going to call you out if you're not singing. You have to simultaneously translate Gloria Gaynor while I'm playing piano. Come on. This is the gold level round for translators. Okay, so 
that's Mule Magic Piano. Now, um, let's go get a new song. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick one that I love here. That was at the hard level. Ave Maria. My, um, my son's called this Burrito Maria. <laughs> I've given up teaching them another language. I'm just teaching them accents. That's the best I can do. Okay, so we're going to practice. So, Ave Maria. Hear it? Okay. You can do Calypso. You can, you can mess up. Okay. So, I played this app, and I didn't like it. Here, how's that? Okay, how's that? I hated it. I mean, what was it good for? It didn't teach you music. It didn't teach you how to read music or learning theory. <coughs> and um, can you hear the music? Okay. And I didn't like it, and I didn't know what it was good for, and I couldn't stop playing it. <laughs> and I had one song, Moonlight Sonata, that I actually learned on the piano way back when, and I would play that on this app over and over and over again. It drove my husband crazy. And there is this one part near the end. I couldn't get it. It was very hard. And I kept trying and trying and trying. Finally, I went into my room. And I went to YouTube. And I found a professional pianist playing it. <laughs> and I listened. And I listened to him playing it until he got to that difficult part. But of course, I didn't just listen. I listened. That kind of listening you do with your eyes closed and your hands in the air, conducting an invisible orchestra. And I learned what the app did. It didn't teach you how to play music. It taught you how to listen, how to experience it, how to be part of something beautiful. And though I had heard that song hundreds of times and I've been around music all my life, I think sitting there on my bed with my iPad was the first time I really heard it. You should see what I can do with all 10 fingers. <laughs> Not surprisingly, it's exactly the same as what I can do with one. So do you want to encourage exploration, customized learning? Do you want to give people experiences? Experiences where they can be exposed to something new or feel something different? Games can change things. Games can enable collaboration. And this is, this is the, the last example I want to share with you. No? OK. Uh, no, we'll be OK. I'll, uh, no, well, please stay. No, please stay. We'll have a party. OK. Um, Glee. Anyone familiar with the TV show Glee? OK. I'm glad you enjoy it. Just so you know, they made it for me. It's a TV show entirely for my interests. But uh, Glee, uh, a show from the United States, it's about a group of kids in high school who are in a singing club, Glee Chorus, okay. And so, of course, they needed a companion app. So if you're going to have an app about a TV show where people sing, you have a karaoke app, right? So this was the karaoke app. So if you've not played karaoke apps or music apps, um, the way it works is you can actually sing into the iPad, you know, twinkle, 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 little, little star, how I wonder, and the, it'll move and it'll show you if you're on pitch or not. So you can sing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but you can also sing the songs that you hear on the TV show. Okay, pretty cool. But then you can also go to the world. And you can see everybody who's logged in and signed in, who's using the app right now singing. And that, this is a screenshot, but at the time we took this screenshot, those people around the world were using the app to sing. And each pulsing dot was a person singing. And I can click on the dot and I can hear them sing. And then I can text them and say, you want to do a duet? And we can sing the song together. So here's a screenshot of someone, I don't know, maybe over in mm, London and Atlanta doing a duet together. And I can just dial in and I can just listen to them. 
So this huge user community developed around the Glee app. People who like to sing, you can get each other points. So these people knew each other. They would write to each other and they would um, text each other and sing with each other. And it was a user community. And the tsunami hit in Japan. That was about two years ago. Do you remember? Such devastation. And part of the human condition is that when we experience trauma and loss, we seek people around us. That happened to me on 9-11, and I pulled coworkers together to be with them. That happens when you have a funeral or a loved one or someone you've lost. You want people to experience it with. That's just part of what we do as humans. And the people in this community needed that as well. So when the tsunami hit, they went to their peers and their colleagues and their friends who were in this app. And they said, let's get together and let's sing a song together as a tribute to the victims of the tsunami. Now, I'd like you to notice this is a recording. Down in the bottom right, it's a chorus of 2,000 people singing together. And the servers shut down. They couldn't, they couldn't track and put a little beam of light across everybody who was singing. But notice how global this is. All over the world, every continent had someone singing. And they could chat to each other. I know you can't read that. It's so far away. Mayo 57, bless you. You are the ones who brought people together throughout this disaster. Every time I hear this, it makes me cry. God bless Japan. This is amazing and really touching. Now you could go in after the fact and add your voice to the recording online. And 4,000 additional people did. So that last I checked, there are over 7,000 people who had added their voice to this chorus as a tribute to the people who were in the tsunami in Japan. And I will tell you as a cynic that this didn't do anything for the people in Japan. It didn't raise money. It didn't send them supplies. But I don't think it was meant to. I think it was meant to do something for the people who were doing the singing. And we have a phrase, think globally, act locally. And who better to know what that really means than the people playing a silly little karaoke app based on a TV show. They have seen what collaboration and community really means and they've never even met each other. To me, that is inspiring. Do you want to be able to enable collaboration? Now, I know with each of these things, these passions that you have, whatever you do, you can't do it in every app. And you may not do it through the entire app. The point of that app was not to eventually enable people to come together in chorus when they were dealing with loss. The point of that game was something else. But there was something magical in that game, one of those beautiful points that transformed those people singing. It transformed me learning about those people singing. That's the power of what games and interactivity can do. Now, I told you about the, the 
the trip to the moon. So let me tell you about my experience with the space shuttle when I was in Florida um, at a conference, and I heard, um, this is 2000, I think, and I heard that there was a shuttle launch. And me, being the space nut, I had to go see the shuttle launch. So I drove to the shuttle launch to the site. I got three other grad students, and we got in our car, in a rental car, and we drove, and we had like an hour, and we drove, and we drove. And about 15 minutes before launch, realized we'd gone the wrong way. So we got off on the thing and I drove as quickly as I could in a car that belonged to somebody else with three strangers and we took off down the road. And um, we realized we weren't gonna make it to the launch site. And we didn't know what, what do we do? Do we just stop? Do we turn around? Do we go back? What, huh? what do we do? And so it was really interesting. About three, four, five minutes before launch time, all the cars on the freeway just parted. They just parted. Everybody going this way went to that side of the road. Everyone going this way to that side of the road. And we all went over and we rolled down our windows and we turned up the radio and we sat on our hoods or up on that hop or in the beds of our truck and we could all hear each other's radio. And we all on the side of the road heard the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And we saw the blast of light go up and we saw the ship. And, and because many of us remember when the space shuttle exploded, we know there's a period of time that you gotta get past that point of time. And we got past that point and everybody on the side of the road erupted in cheers. And we were yelling and we were cheering and we were slapping each other on the back like we had anything to do with it, you know. <laughs> we were just the idiots. None of us could even get there in time, you know. And we were all just united in what it was like to be a human being. Like, how cool, look what we just did. And it was an amazing, amazing moment for me. And here's why, all of these strangers, we were united because we were on the same road, we were looking in the same direction, and most importantly, we all believed that that was something worth doing. We were all there and believed that that was something worth doing. And you have given your time these past two days. You're giving your career. You're giving your learning opportunities. You all are competent people. You could be doing other things. And you choose to do this. We are all on the same road, looking in the same direction. What do we want to do? What do we want to do? Because games, games can change things. We've seen that in all these examples I've given you from my life. You have examples from your life. But it's not the games, it's the game makers. It's the game makers who can change things. On our projects, big and small, we are the one who have that potential. So I'll ask you here, what do you want to do? What is it that you want to do? Not the perfect game, not, the, you, not all your games, you can't do that. You're going to have to have a business model, you're going to have to make money, I know that. But don't lose sight of why you're here. Do you want to tell stories, explore history, decrease violence, create wonder, live vicariously, work with friends? I have, you know, pick your own things. Why do you want to do? And make sure you know what you want to do and keep that foremost in your career and the work that you're doing. And when you do that, I know our industry will be better. And I thank you for that. I thank you for your passion and your dedication. And I hope that this has been as good a conference for you as it has been for me. Thank you. I got so involved telling stories, I have no idea what time it is. Forgive me if I kept you late. Okay, thank you. Questions? Yes, I am a professional singer. Who asked? It's my second career. Oh, you want me to use a crystal ball and tell you what I think we can do for family games, for people playing together. You know, the first thing I have to say is how wonderful that we're even thinking in terms of that. Because for so long, the game has been the domain of the individual person using it. And they would shut out the rest of the world while they would immerse themselves in this game. And that's not a bad thing. 
but it's wonderful that we are starting to see games that encourage playing. And in the US, we call it co-play, when a parent and a child play together. Toka Boca, uh, a beautiful company. They do beautiful apps. Toka Boca Tea Party, T-O-C-A-B-O-C-A. -O -O so I'm hoping that as our industry matures, because our industry is still so young, it is. I am hoping that we start seeing more and more collaborative games for families to play together, online, or just all around one device. That's what I hope. You all need to go make that happen. Go do that. Game-like. Okay. Okay. So he directs, develops databases, and he's looking at using some game mechanics or some game possibilities into databases to make them more relevant or more usable. Do I think that's a good idea? It, I prefer that over traditional databases. You know, I, there's, um, you know, there's two terms that I'm sure you all have used before. One is gamification and the other being game-based learning. And how I define the difference between the two is gamification takes a behavior and rewards you for it with points. Okay, and as I demoed, I don't like games that do that for learning. I don't think that's a good learning model. But it can be a very effective model for behavior change. Zamzi is a, uh, Hope Labs did it. It's a pedometer kids wear, tracks their steps, and then they turn the, it in online and they can ca get cash and rewards and gift certificates for their points. Phenomenal in terms of behavioral change, getting kids to be more active. It's really very good. So I can't say no to gamification because I've seen how it works really well. So I think it would, it's difficult to answer that because it depends on the mechanic that you want to bring in. But I think what games teaches the rest of us, everything I showed today is not games. Very few things actually is what are games. But I think what it speaks to is the power of interactivity, the power of collaboration, and the power of customization, letting people do what they want to do. So he is, this is an open call. He wants people to help him put some game strategies. And what is your name? Juan Manuel. Juan Manuel. Juan Manuel. If any of you are listening to him and say, I can do that, go and see Juan Manuel because he's looking for someone to help him with this challenge. 3D. 3D. 3D games, the name of your company. Or you want 3D games. Got it. He wants it in 3D. 2D need not apply. <laughs> 4D might be over his budget. <laughs> it's 3D only. Okay, got it. Hey, Oscar. We spend a lot of time in the industry comparing ourselves with films, with music. And I think that we can do a lot of service. I think what you described, right, right. Is this something, why are we so insecure in the industry? I don't know. Can you tell me why I'm so insecure about my weight? I mean,. <laughs> I've never liked my nose. Shall we talk about that? Um, so <laughs> Oscar wanted to know, it's, I have other positive things. You heard my singing. So it's not just about my nose. Um, the, so Oscar wanted to know, <laughs> thank you, on my top, I look like a glitter ball. That's two things in my favor. Um, so Oscar wanted to know, um, why are we in games so hung up about game? Is, it's a game, man. It's not something else. I think that's, I don't know. I'm just prognosticating here. I have the microphone. I guess I can. Um, I think it's human nature to find ways we differentiate ourselves from other people and to try to say we're better than other people. I think that happens. But your point is well taken in that they're all merging. Who cares if it's a game anymore? I mean, there's things out there that are not really games that keep points. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I hope, you know, I hope game makers don't shoot me for this, but who cares if it's a game or not? What we care about is if it's engaging to the user. Um, a friend of mine, 
he puts it this way, he's a game developer. His name is Garen, Darren Karstens. He does math apps. And you know, if you think about a time you learned something, not math, but something else, you were a woodcraft or something you could cook or a, a musical thing on the guitar you couldn't do. Think about a time you learned something and how awesome it was and how good it felt to be able to do something you couldn't do and see your progress and share it with other people. That's a wonderful thing. And Darren says, learning is fun. Our job is to not screw that up. And I think gaming, interactivity, engagement, that's fun. Our job is to not screw that up. As game makers, our job is to do no harm. It's to not put in scoring and monetization, all those things that can cause harm in our games that ruins the experience. So, see, uh, you're watching Clock Pablo? Okay, I don't want to, okay. Mm -hmm. Games for kids, two to five. Okay. <laughs> ah, see. La idea es cómo hacer para que estos juegos de pronto no, o sea, hacia qué tendencia van los juegos hacia los niños de esas edades mm -hmm. que están tomando los tabletas, los smartphones, los manejan muy fácilmente. You're gonna have to help me. <laughs> so, so, what is the tendency that you can see for games at that age? Oh, what is the tendency for kids of very young, games for kids in the very young age group? Okay, so I, I think a lot about this. There's an excellent conference in the U.S. called Dust or Magic. They happen three times a year. One is e-books, one is apps, one is all media. So, and I have young children, one is nine, one is five. So I think a lot about that. Um, the American Association of Pediatricians released a statement, and we hear this all the time, about limiting screen time for kids so that kids don't spend too much time in front of screens, which is ridiculous. Because what, what is a screen? Screen. Is it a TV? Is it a laptop? Is it an iPhone? Is it an iPad? Well, what if you're using the app to identify leaves in the forest? Is that screen time? So when, when we hear about young audiences, I'm very excited about it, particularly as we're seeing young apps that help with kids with autism, with special needs learners. Um, with uh, things that bring families together. I have a, I have a uh, frog dissection app. Do you do that here? Dissect frogs in biology? Yeah, cut them open. Okay. That's fun. And so I have an app where you can do it virtually. And I was reviewing apps for a group called Parents' Choice Foundation. And I was looking at it. And my son, my five-year-old, picked up this app. And he kept dissecting the frog. And I kept saying, oh, honey, that's not for you. That you can't read. You, can't, you don't want to use that yet. And he kept opening it up anyway and using it anyway. And when we went to my parents' house, I kind of have a rule at grandma and grandpa's house, no iPads, just you know, they need time with the kids on their laps, or if they want to use the iPad, they have to do it with the grandparent. And so he wanted to show that app because he wanted to show Grams what the inside of a frog looks like, which I thought, one, there's a lot worse ways he could learn that. <laughs> and two, he is learning. I worry that is he going to get to like ninth grade and think dissecting frogs? I did that when I was five, you know. But what he's learning is there is a scientific process for things. There is a way to go through things. There's a way for us to make comparisons. There is value to exploring and looking and wondering. And he's learning that at five. And I would have never let him do that. I never would have given him that opportunity. And he kind of stumbled upon it on the app. And it was a great experience for him. So when we think about apps for two to five, absolutely, there's some great ones out there. We don't need any more alphabet apps. They already know their colors. We have that area taken care of. Thank you very much. However, if now we can move into other ways, getting them to make comparisons, thinking mathematically, communicating with parents, dealing with their emotions, there's so much social and emotional development that happens in young kids. I'm hoping we can use our games to do that and to bring parents into that conversation so that parents start thinking about other areas. All parents think, I need my kids to learn their alphabet. I want them to learn their colors. And there's a bunch of other stuff I don't know. So if we can have apps and games that model that, that really is exciting for me. He wants to, you know, something I believe. See? Do I think it would be feasible to replace the traditional education system with tablets and things? I'm very careful with that word replace because there, there is, as much as I am for self-guided interaction and instruction, absolutely. Vygotsky talked about a more capable other.
And the idea with a more capable other is that when you need to learn something, there is someone more capable than you to guide you. Often teachers, parents, families take that role. I have seen iPads, I have seen games take that role. But when we talk about replacing education, I think we often think of a world where everybody gets to do a math program and you log into levels one to three and then you move forward and you get a gold star and then when you're ready and it's great it's customized because it might take you less time to do levels one to six than it teaches me takes me and oh problem solved so I don't care if technology replaces education that I don't want that what I want is better education to replace education you know that's all of our goals and yes that's an iPad and yes that's games but yes that's teachers and yes that's social interaction and yes that's exposure to new content and new ways of thinking so I don't think games and technology will replace traditional teaching but I think it will expand traditional teaching as we keep striving to improve the ways we help people learn but that's also your job, get on that. <laughs> Last one, okay, yes. So what kind of methodologies uh, para enseñanza? What, what kind of uh, learning methods have you used in, in, the, in the application that you Okay, what kind of learning methods have I used in the, me the media that we develop? I'd like everyone to stay another hour because I have a talk on that. No, I'm kidding. I, no. Um, that's, a, that's a huge question, of course. And so um, if I were to give you another talk on that, I would tell you that, you know, we don't know for sure how people learn. We have a lot of theories of how people learn. We have some very good theories by a lot of very bright people. You know, you can, you can look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as, as Oscar was talking about. Um, we can talk about... Um, uh, uh, wow, it's really hard to think with that. Um, I, I hope the translators are making me sound smarter. But the, you know, there's all these different theories on how people learn. Um, so I can't tell you that one is better than the others because it, I think it just depends. It depends what kind of theory. But what I encourage game developers to do, and some of you are educators, some of you are not, and that's okay. But more and more, more game developers are becoming educators, even if you're not making a math app or a geography app, you are still teaching people in your game, even if it's just education. So what I encourage you to do is fully embrace Wikipedia, go <laughs> read about learning theorists. Just, you know, you can spend half an hour reading about some of them and you will read four or five of them and there's gonna be one that speaks to you and you're gonna say, that's how I think people learn. That's how I think people learn what I want them to learn. And that's awesome. I don't think we have to all have the same learning theory. But if you don't have something articulated for yourself, if you don't think about it, you will default to how you think you learned. And we are as bad at that as we are about telling you why we like something. We always miss how we think we learned. So then we think, I learned math by doing flashcards. I will make a flashcard game. When really math is such a complex thing, you can't narrow it down to a set of flashcards. So I would encourage people to go learn your own theories. And Wikipedia, it's a great, you don't have to take a whole class, just read it. See what speaks to you, think about it, talk to other people, and see what it means in terms of game design the shortest I could give to a really complex question. Creo que tuvimos una excelente charla. Por favor, agradezcamos de nuevo a Barbara.